morning, everybody, and welcome to Shrug 2021, the second session of our second day of the morning. I uh, want to welcome everybody here and thank you for participating with this uh, virtual workshop here. I want to thank our sponsors here, as you see on the screen here. You know, we had hoped to be in person this year and not have to do another virtual one, but unfortunately it didn't work out. Uh, We're planning already to be in person next year. However, thanks to the generous uh, support of these sponsors, uh, we were able to provide this virtual conference and uh, their their support has actually underwrote uh, under this uh, entire conference so that we could be able to provide it to you at no charge. Uh, so if you do have any, um, know anybody that works with some of these organizations uh, or has some professional dealings with them, the next time you have contact with them, uh, give them a thanks for helping support Shrug and helping support this workshop uh, so that we can provide this to you at no, no charge. This morning's session, uh, we're going to be uh, myself, actually, as the moderator and also the presenter this time, uh, Dwayne Treaton um, with the city of Thomasville, and it's Voices from the Past, Mapping Unmarked Graves. And we're going to be talking about a project we have going on up here in Thomasville uh, with that. There is a question box. Uh, if you do have questions throughout the uh, presentation, please add them to the question box. Uh, we'll try to answer if there, if there are a number of them, we'll try to answer as many as we can. We do have to hard stop right around 1045 that we do have to stop the program so that others can be able to get in and get this uh, this session room set up and such. But do put your question at the bottom. I will uh, be looking at them uh, and we'll try to get them all answered by the end. Um, this webinar, if we want to let you know, is being recorded. Uh, so we just want to make sure everybody knows that. And just give me a second while I switch out my screen to start my presentation. All right. Well, as good morning again. As I said, I'm Dwayne Trade. I'm with the city of Thomasville. Uh, I've been working with GIS for quite a number of years here in various areas within the city, and I've had the uh, the pleasure and I think even honor actually to be working on this project uh, within our historic cemeteries. Um, so let's go and just if you're not familiar with Thomasville, um, Thomasville is a, a community in Georgia. We're just uh, just north of Tallahassee, probably about 30 miles or so north of Tallahassee, but on the Georgia side of the border. And uh, kind of related to our historic past, we had a very thriving um, historic town and historic vibe in the Victorian era. Uh, they would like to say that this was the end of the railroad until Flagler and Mr. Plant and such, you know, extended the railroads down into Florida and such. Uh, so it became a very uh, well-known resort community for Northerners, particularly from the Chicago, the Cleveland, and the Pittsburgh area, uh, Detroit and such like that would come down here. And they built, as we'd say, their, their winter cottages, which of course are way bigger um, than many of our houses. Uh, we do have, um, it, it was also promoted, um, and I find it's kind of humorous that Thomas was promoted uh, as a health resort with a pine-scented air. Uh, I think people forgot about the pine pollen that came with that air too. Uh, we do have a, a you know we, we take our historic preservation historic history very seriously here in thomasville uh, we have 10 nationally designated historic districts and six locally designated historic districts and these districts uh you know kind of contribute from the victorian era like on dawson street and top area and stuff like that uh to working class areas um and such like dewey city and uh, the east end and area like that and some of our historic resources if you're interested in learning more about the history of thomasville that the uh, jack hadley uh, black history museum uh, Thomasville History Center and, of course, Thomasville Landmarks are great resources to find out more about Thomasville. But, you know, we do have this rich um, past and this rich kind of uh, history of trying to preserve our past and protect our past. Uh, but one area that was kind of lacking for a while was our historic cemeteries. And some of our cemeteries we have in Thomasville, uh, we have Old Magnolia, which is um, affectionately, if you hear people talk about Flipper Cemetery, that's actually, its original name was um, Magnolia, and of course now it's called Old Magnolia, because we have a, a new Magnolia, uh, but Old Magnolia or Flipper, now is predominantly our African-American cemetery. Uh, we have Old City Cemetery, which was predominantly our white cemetery. Magnolia, um, there's an old section that's front Vine Street. Uh, so if you're familiar with Thomas Street, come up and you look at Vine Street, there's an older section that fronts uh, Vine Street, but the newer section, uh, which they, is still active, um, is on Cassie Road area. Laurel Hill Cemetery, which is kind of what most people think when they think of our, our cemeteries in Thomasville. Laurel Hill is one of our largest one. It has a historic section uh, that has, you know, some mosques and mausoleums, uh, many monuments and such. Uh, if you are uh, knowledgeable or you want to test your skill at the iconography of um, headstones and tombstones and such, 
um, that is a good cemetery to go to the historic section there. But it's also a very active cemetery with uh, with burials still going on. And then peaceful rest is probably what we you know one of our, our newer cemeteries, even though it is it is old, but it's not quite old to the historic level yet. And it's another active cemetery that we have going here. So we have a lot, a good, you know, variety of cemeteries, uh, but it's the um, the Flipper Cemetery, Old Magnolia or Flipper, and Old City Cemetery we're going to talk about most today. And those are our, what we consider our historic cemeteries. Uh, there are no more uh, burials going on in those. They're closed as far as for burials and such. Uh, and they have a, a, a rich history that we wanted to preserve uh, and to keep going, and also to record for future um, for future use, whether it was uh, research or also just general knowledge of people coming in uh, in the town and such. So how do we get involved with this? Uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, there were, you know, we kind of took a notice as a city that, hey, you know, we're, we're very protective of our historic housing stock and buildings and such, but our historic cemeteries said weren't 100% uh, being kind of protected or even recognized as much. They were kind of there and, you know, the public works and ground crews where they cut the grass and such like that. But we weren't really paying as much attention as we probably should have, and we realized that we needed to start doing it. And our, uh, at the time, our, our senior assistant city manager, uh, Kay McDonald, uh, really took an interest in these historic cemeteries and started working with uh, various groups and saying, okay, what can we do uh, with our historic cemeteries? First, to pr preserve them. Uh, and to record the history uh, and also to improve them as far as to uh, not allow any more deterioration of the history or loss of any history. Uh, and one of the things is they started going around with these cemeteries to notice that there was, you know, open areas and such and they're, you know, got thinking that there, there must be people that are buried in here, uh, but for whatever reason that the, the grave marker is no longer there. And it can be a case that was a, a gravestone, uh, you know, in the past if the family didn't have the the funds to, to purchase a proper grave marker, uh, they would put a stone in that area, in a, you know, a larger stone, but a stone there to kind of mark so that when they did save the money to get a proper uh, grave marker, you know, they would go back and, and know where to go. Well, of course, over a year you know, in time, if they never did put a proper marker there and maintenance crews coming through and see this stone just sitting on the ground, you know, pick up the stones and move them off the side. So lose it that way. Uh, it may be a case that the that there was a, a mark of some sort, but it was of an organic material, maybe wood or something like that, in which it has deteriorated over time, or the grave marker just has been, you know, out of disrepair, fell over, moved, and, and lost. Uh, so there was knowledge that there there must be unmarked graves there. And as you can see, we we first brought in uh, Miss uh, uh, Susie Goodhope, and uh, she's a nationally recognized expert in the use of the uh, cadaver dogs, or also you know human rain, uh, detection rain dogs. Uh, with that, and, and her, her team came in and uh, back in 2011, uh, kind of did a preliminary survey, kind of to kind of see, okay, what do we really have here? Do we have a, a high concentration of unmarked graves, a low concentration? Uh, does it warrant further investigation so that we can identify uh, the location of some marked graves? And so they came in uh, with the teams and bringing in the cadaver dogs, did a search, and they were able to uh, identify that there was a high concentration of unmarked graves, especially in the Flipper Cemetery uh, in that area there. And so, you know, based on that finding that, hey, we have something here and we, ne we need to explore further and we need maybe put some more resources onto it, uh, we then moved into bringing in the ground penetrating radar to look at the cemeteries. Uh, here's just a, a shot here of uh, um, Miss Susie, um, uh, Susie with her team, uh, some of her dogs, uh, Shiraz and then uh, interesting to note, this is early on in Shiraz, like I said, we're talking, you know, what, uh, 10 years ago, uh, and since then, Shiraz's skills have really um, uh, improved and honed, uh, has actually won uh, some national recognition, as you can see there, with the uh, 2020 AKA Search and Rescue Ace Award, uh, as well as was recognized by the Florida Bar as the Animal Achievement Award in 2018, so she's, uh, uh, Miss Suze is an excellent handler, and she has an uh, excellent trainer for her dogs with that. But to bring it into ground pen radar, so with the, the dog's work and, and their kind of identification that we do have uh, unmarked graves here, we do have a high concentration, we need to explore a little bit more, we need to, to find out more about this. Uh, we then brought in ground penetrating radar and we contracted with Omega Mapping Services uh, to come in and conduct that survey. And they, it's ground, uh, unmarked graves is one of their specialties that they have. Uh, so they were really uh, highly capable of coming in and doing that. Uh, as you can see here is a picture of Len, the, the, the main guy, uh, owner of the Omega mapping here, uh, with the ground penetrated radar uh, running across, and then some screenshot captures of what they're looking at. 
Now to the trained eye, um, they can see exactly what, what it is underground. Uh, to my eye, I just see some squiggly lines. Um, and of course, uh, trying to explain to it. But uh, with the, you know, with the ground penetrating radar, if you're not familiar, of course, it's sending a, a, a radar beam down there and it's bouncing off and stuff and sending a signal back. And through that interpretation of the location, the depth, uh, uh, size and stuff of these anomalies underground, uh, they would then mark a grave as far as being a, a potential unmarked grave with high confidence. Now, one thing we stress is that, um, you know, and, and um, Mr. Stroh said, you know, we don't say for sure that there's a grave there because until you actually go un and you find, you know, human remains, uh, you know, bone fragments, stuff like that, you can't be 100% sure just by doing this. But based on the, the, the depth of the cavity, the size of it, the orientation even, um, because, you know, most graves are, are, are are in a, a um, east-west kind of orientation. So based on a, a number of things and kind of a totality of the elements presented in the uh, the radar screen, uh, they then can mark with high confidence. And so you'll see on some maps that have HC, meaning high confidence that there's an unmarked grave uh, in there. And this was the results of the ground penetrating radar. So this is a, a map that they produced for um, Old Magnolia or Flipper Cemetery. Uh, and each one of those dots as you're looking on there actually represents an unmarked grave that they identified with high confidence. So, and of course you can see that the squares and, and rectangles and such are, are known graves. If they have some writing in it, and of course it's you know hard to see on screen, but has some writing on it, that means that there was a, some type of grave marker was there. So they've recorded that information uh, without markers. It may be that it was a brick top or concrete topped uh, grave marker um, with that a sunken area and such like that with some you know remnants of a, of a grave vault and such in there. Uh, but it's really uh, interesting when you look at Flipper Cemetery here and you know that this was our predominantly you know for a long time our African American cemetery and you see this you know there's relatively compared to the size of the cemetery not a lot of marked graves there uh, but a lot of open spaces and so you know we just knew there had to be a lot of unmarked graves in you know, based on the, the cadaver dog work and then, of course, the follow-up with the ground penetrating radar, uh, we identify a lot of them. In the first, in 2011, the first time they ran through, I think it was 722 uh, graves were found. They've, they've come back again and done some more surveys and actually have added to that. Uh, and my work actually, you know, has recorded even more than that 700, you know, about uh, 842 unmarked graves with it. When you look at Old City Cemetery, and again, remember this is our predominantly white cemetery, there's a lot more marked graves that you can see, and there's a lot less unmarked graves. However, there are still some good concentrations there of the unmarked graves. Uh, and what I find interesting looking at this map here that they came up with is you see the, the line going across towards the bottom. That is the, the fence. There is the, the old fence is still there for the cemetery. However, there's a whole bunch, as you can see on the very bottom, of unmarked graves that are outside of the cemetery boundaries. So that lets us know that that fencing is that is around there was uh, put in at a later date um, because the, the actual boundaries of the cemetery were further than what the fencing would have us to believe. Uh, so it's an interesting outcome that, that came from that. Now, interesting here that the, unfortunately at the time when uh, Omega Mapping was doing the service, they did not use GPS to GPS these points. Uh, so they paid kind of, kind of did a grid system as you can see there and then kind of hand drawn in you know kind of like an, an archaeologist might do on a on a site uh, where had a grid system in locating the objects onto a grid system so they're lang lo located you know basically by by hand so we don't have the gps coordinates and that was um, you know kind of unfortunate that at the time they were not using gps with that um, so what that allowed us to, or what that you know, kind of set up is that you know, we now have to try to refine those markers. Now, thankfully at the time, part of the service is they did put in iron markers and we'll have some, some images later coming up, but they did put in iron survey markers uh, in there wherever they have it. So wherever there's a point, a survey marker was put in. Uh, and so you know, the, the job for me was to come back and find those markers 10 years later uh, and then map them out. And here you see on here are some of the survey markers that they put in. Uh, and you kind of see this, these are ones that are recent taken. These weren't uh, taken that, you know, in 2011 when they put them in. Uh, so these were, you know, recently taken over the, the last year. Um, but you can see that some of them stayed on the top or still visible. But like you look at the lower um, right-hand corner, uh, some of them were kind of hidden down there. And some are, are found were actually totally underground, have been covered over the, the, the decade of, 
of time that had passed are actually totally covered. Uh, and we had to locate them, of course, with uh, locators and such. Uh, but they have an idea. So it's a really a nice hefty survey marker was put in there. So it's a very good identifying um, tool that we're able to use to be able to look up and find those unmarked graves again and kind of rediscover them. Uh, so the actual work that I was was doing. So what what I was brought into is to bring in and to map those unmarked graves, to locate those survey markers, uh, and then to be able to map those the unmarked graves. Uh, and then the equipment that we used, and we um, have to say, yeah, we were very uh, fortunate in order to get a a supportive uh, benefactor uh, that was able to help us purchase some of this GPS equipment because at the time I did not have the the, the proper GPS equipment in order to you know record it with some some degree of accuracy. You know, I didn't necessarily need you know, an eight to $10,000 survey grade GPS system, but I did want to get one to where we can get it relatively close, uh, with the point relatively close so that in future, you know, people that have to come in future relying on my data would have a, a much uh, more close area and small area that, to search for. Um, I did set my limits on, on the GPS equipment to be 2.5 feet um, as the, being the maximum uh, amount um, out of, of, of accuracy. Uh, so I want to get 2.5 or below in order to be able to map it. But the equipment that we actually uh, identified was the um, Aeros, um, Aero 100 uh, GNSS uh, and we used the Esri collector. And I did look at quite a few GPS units uh, before de determining that this would probably be the best fit for, for this project and for future projects. Uh, working on and some of the the key things is one as you see it was sub meter so it, it met that that requirement it didn't have to be survey grade so that put it in that sub meter price range which was in within within my budget area um also that it could pick up multi -const uh, constellation which a lot of them nowadays of course are coming out with um but you can pick all the all the known ones and they are adding as as new uh, constellations might become uh, available and such uh, they'll be added on uh, also, the Bluetooth connectivity uh, was really important because we did want to use um, collector or quick capture. You know, in future might be survey one, two, three we're using and such. Uh, so we have that Bluetooth con uh, connectivity with the iPad, so we can you know have that that workflow. Uh, and the, the Aeros company has a, is a, a partner with Esri, so they do work um, very very close with Esri to make sure that their equipment is compatible with the products coming out with Esri. Uh, we also wanted one that was on a multiple op multiple operating system. Now, I primarily use iPads, uh, but there is a potential, you know, some people might have an Android device they're using out there uh, and have to use it with it. So we wanted one that could be cross compatibility. And this was even, you know, compatible with Windows. So iOS, Android, and Windows, it'll be compatible with. So uh, there will be no limitation as far as if another department needed to use this equipment uh, and they were having to be on Android as their primary data collector, there'd be no issue as far as being able to loan out that they'd have to get special equipment or they'd have to borrow, you know, my equipment with it. So that was a good thing. And of course, as mentioned before, it's Esri ready. So it's already ready with, uh, you know, it's compatible with collector, field maps, you know, now of course, uh, the kind of the, the, the next version, next generation of collector, uh, quick capture, and of course, survey one, two, three. So basically any of the Esri products that can consume a GPS signal, uh, this equipment is, is compatible with. Now, in order to get into the, the data, you know, to get into the real GIS part, you know, I, I got my GPS equipment, you know, I know where I'm going. Um, how do I set up the data for the collecting? Uh, and then I had to do it in Arc Pro. Uh, so I started in Arc Pro, um, we had to use the, the Add GPS Metadata Field Tool uh, in order to be able to. So I created my, my basic point layer, which had the information I wanted uh, to collect for the for the graves and primarily in this first run of collecting the points I wanted to know what cemetery it was in and also wanted to know type uh, of object that I was you know point I was collecting as well as then having a place for notes so it was really some basic information we weren't to the point now we'll go back later and for the the marked graves we'll record all of the information the you know the text and the, the type and iconography and, and photographs and such um, when we come back and get the marked graves uh, but for this first pass through for the unmarked graves of Maine, I want to know the cemetery, uh, the type of point. And the reason I say type of point, because uh, you think, well, you're just collecting the unmarked graves. Uh, but actually, you know, we, we did um, identify artifacts out there. So we found as, as we were doing the, the locating, we'd find some iron posts that were underground that were posts from old fences that might have been around a family plot. Uh, and so we would map out those. Um, was not, and you'll see a photograph coming up soon of a ceramic. Uh, bowl that was in um, 
uh, upside down in the ground. So we wanted to uh, identify those items as well while we're out there and collect those items. So using a tool and it's relatively easy, you pretty much in Arc Pro, you, you pick the point data that you want to add the GPS uh, metadata to, uh, and then you just hit run. And then it adds, and uh, as you can see, it adds a whole bunch of fields to it. Uh, and most of them they won't use. So if you have RTK, uh, type of GPS, it has the fields already pre-populated for that to bring in that data. If you're just using the subnet, uh, then it has the data for that as well. So it populates all that information in it. So now you can have your, your GPS uh, data brought right in there on that layer. Now, the next step, of course, is I'm using this with Collector. So I have to make sure that this um, layer is available via the web. Uh, so I just did the, you know, use the share. Uh, web layer and then publish web layer. So that can have a feature uh, layer up into our RGS Online organizational account that then can be consumed uh, whether I'm using Collector and also as you'll see later uh, consumed with the dashboard as well uh, or in you know the, the new maps and other things like that. So we want to have that up there published. Now you could have done all of this in um, RGS Online itself. Um, you could have created theirs. You can create uh, GPS enabled point data in ArcGIS Online. Uh, so that is another way if you're sitting out thinking, well, you know, I, I don't want to use Pro or I haven't used Pro yet, you know, how can I do this? If you do have ArcGIS Online, you just go in there and you'll create your new feature layer, point layer, uh, and one of the templates is one that will collect, add all the, the GPS data fields for it. But this just happened to be the, the method that I used to go through. So now that I have my data set up, I set up an Arc Pro, I've now shared it and created as a feature layer. Uh, in RGS Online, uh, and of course, I filled in all my, my metadata um, this, so that all the information, if somebody else has to use this layer, they'll have all that information. Uh, the next step, of course, is to set up your editing permissions, and this is going to vary on your type of project that you want to do, uh, the, your needs, or maybe even organizational requirements on how data can be shared and edited. Uh, so you go into the um, under the feature layer hosted and your settings and down to editing and then you would click on or off those tabs you need but you do need to make sure that it is in an editable format so that you can share it out and it's also advisable that you make a view um, uh, another feature layer to be a review uh, that is not shared out with any edit editing capability and that way you don't have to share out your feature layer that can be edited and just turn off editing you can actually have a second layer that is consuming the same information, just a view of it, um, but it's a lot safer and easier to use that in public facing uh, kind of applications where you want to show the data, or maybe it's even an internal application uh, that you're showing it for other departments to see, but you don't want necessarily to have them possibly have the accidental uh, ability to do any editing on it. Uh, so that's just uh, one thing you might want to consider is creating that view layer as well with it. So now that I have my data set up, I've got my GPS equipment, it's time to go out into the field. Now, as of right now, I've only worked in um, Flipper Cemetery. Uh, and just as a side note, why we do up here in Thomasville, if you're not familiar, why we call Old Magnolia Flipper Cemetery, uh, is because uh, we have the reinterment of Lieutenant um, Henry Onassis Flipper, who was the first African-American graduate of West Point, uh, who was a, a, a from Thomasville, his family was from Thomasville and such. And so he was reinterned there. So he was actually buried in this cemetery. And so uh, ever since uh, that time when he was reinterned re into Flip, uh, Old, Old Magnolia, uh, has been uh, kind of affectionately called Flipper Cemetery uh, with it. Uh, so when it's time to go out there, um, I went out and borrowed actually the locate tool um, from our engineering department in order to be able to find the iron pins. And as you can see in the pictures, once I located them, then I put a little survey marking flag there. Um, at first, I, I thought I was only going to need about 200, so I signed out about 200. Um, once I finally got those all put out, realized I was going to need a lot more. Uh, I actually ran out uh, from a warehouse of the, 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 we had white ones and some green ones and such with no marking. That I actually had to start using some of our CNS, which is our, our cable company the city has, some of their survey plays because there was just so many uh, unmarked graves I was discovering out there. Uh, but I used the locate tool. Uh, from engineering and we also had a metal detector that we would purchased as well so we'd have more than one person um, i found the locate tool to be a lot easier to work with the the metal detector was great um, but i think the problem was it was it was so good 
uh, because it was one that could detect gold and silver and tin and, and all the different types of metals. And so it, it took, you know, about an hour or so of using it uh, to be able to recognize what tone was the proper tone and intensity for one of the markers I was looking for, where the, the engineering locate tool, of course, was made just for basically iron or survey marking pins like that. So it was real easy to use that um, to, to be able to identify them. Uh, but we use those and like so once I identify when we put the flag on it, once I got a, a large enough section done, completed, then I would come in and bring the GPS equipment and we'd map it. And actually, if you back from the uh, the map, the the surveyors, um, when they did the ground penetrating radar, divided the cemetery flipper into three sections. So I probably tried to work on three different sections, you know, just do complete one section at a time to work on an area. Uh, so once out there, and you, as you can see in the lower right there, you can see one of the markers had has worked its way down underground. There are quite a few like that. So while there were, you know, the number that were on the top, as you can see in the, the center bottom there, um, and also in the picture with the, the uh, range pole um, over, over the market, get ready to take a GPS reading. Uh, there were quite a few that were under the ground that had to dig up. And uh, basically I would have the, the locate tool to make the, the, the right tone that I, that I was, had become familiar with. Uh, indicating a survey marker, and then I had a long um, flathead screwdriver that I just kind of poked in the ground because I didn't want to dig too too much around an area because uh, we are in, in in a cemetery and sacred ground, so I didn't want to do too much you know big digging. So I would just use that that very long um, uh, flathead screwdriver, kind of poking the ground until I felt some resistance that felt like the marker, and I do try to do as as little digging as possible uh, in there to be able to identify the marker. As I mentioned before, we didn't just identify the um, unmarked graves. That was our primary target that we were looking for to record those. But also as we're out there, we did find a lot of artifacts um, as well. Uh, and you can see some of there. So on the, the upper right is that ceramic bowl that I mentioned, the, the locator for some reason, there must be something more metal maybe underneath it um, that was indicating it. So we did uh, dig down a little bit uh, to it and we identified that. Um, with these artifacts, we left them in place. So like with that bowl, I, I dug just enough to expose it, to photograph it, to document it, and I placed the dirt back over it. Uh, and the other pictures there, most of the other ones you see across the top are some of the um, uh, iron fencing posts or rods that were in the ground. Uh, and it was interesting, when we found one, we would then see if there was some marked graves, as you can see like in the, the lower uh, right-hand corner, of those, those two bottom pictures there, it's near a marked area. Um, one was kind of defined with some concrete around, the other one not. Uh, and so we did look around to see if we could find other iron markers maybe to delineate a family plot area. In some cases, we were able to find, you know, two of the four or three of the four, or sometimes it was just that one we found. Uh, but we wanted to mark those as well. Uh, and then even some bricks. As you can see, the, uh, the second in on the lower uh, left-hand side uh, was uh, just a brick that was above ground. Uh, so we do have our maintenance crews that do come in, of course, for, you know, doing the raking and the mowing and such like that. Uh, so we did put a flag by there and marked it, and that flag, you know, is marked, you know, do not disturb, do not move. Uh, so we, we mapped it, um, we photographed it, and we also put that flag there to hopefully for it to stay in place. But in the event that it does get moved in the future, we will have it on the map um, marked as where this brick, and we're not, not sure where the brick came from, um, but that there here is a brick and it was found at this location. So the end result after doing it, and this is the uh, the dashboard that created uh, kind of more for, for internal use uh, and the link is there. Uh, and I've note that if you look down in the, the handouts area, you should be able to see a, a, a PDF um, handout of this presentation. And so this link is there and it's active and it's, it's shared public. So you are welcome to come in and take a look at this um, dashboard at your own. And hopefully technology works, we're gonna look at it right here um, as well and get it to load up. And let me uh, share the proper screen and bring it over. So this is the dashboard and um, that created. So this is the work that we've done. So Flipper Cemetery is complete as far as the unmarked grave mapping. So you know, com complete that marking. And, you know, back in before when they first did the first run of the ground penetrating radar, uh, they were able to identify, you know, about uh, just over 700, 722 or so unmarked graves. And they'd come back um, after that and actually uh, did some more work in that area. And actually the, the cadaver dogs, Miss Susie and, and her fantastic team and colleagues came back and, 
and have, have used as a training site as well as to help us to identify uh, unmarked graves in this area and some other areas in town as well. So more graves are identified and you see uh, in Flipper Cemetery, you know, each one of those red dots with the flag in it, each one of the red ones is an unmarked grave. Um, and it really, when, when I look at this map, I, I think and I see that number of 842. Uh, that's 842 individuals to 842 people, uh, their final resting place. Unfortunately, we do not have any records um, of Flipper Cemetery of interment records. Um, we have uh, checked with our cemetery administration. They've looked at historical archives that the city has. Uh, we've checked other areas and there is no record of interment. So uh, the really sad part is that we will probably never know um, the names of any of these people uh, that are you know, in these unmarked graves here. However, through this project and, and the generosity of some of our benefactors to be able to get the equipment and such, um, we may not know their name, but we will, they won't be forgotten that we know that there is, there is someone there um, in that area. And it really is um, kind of a personal note doing this work. You know, when I first got it, I was really in a GPS, you know, our GIS mindset, data collection, great project. But as I'm out there and I was, did this primarily by myself, so I was out there with myself doing all this work, um, really got to thinking, you know, here is a, a person that was buried here and here's, you know, a, a, a graveside service was held here, family and everything like that. Uh, and it really took on a, a, a lot more importance and, and personal kind of touch to me as I did this work and um, really I'm proud of this work to do uh, with it. And you can see kind of some of the actually, and I'll go to the, the next tab here. Um, this is my, my horizontal accuracy and I, I'm using this one because one of the things I want to do uh, is, uh, in the future is come back and try to improve. And we'll talk a little about in just a little bit, how I'm going to work on trying to improve some of these areas. So if we go in, we can kind of do, there is some tree coverage here. Thankfully I, I had, I, I did this in the um, early or late winter, um, uh, springtime earlier this year. So it was a lot of uh, tree uh, leaf off. Uh, so I was able to get decent um, GPS signals in most of the cemetery, but there's some areas that, you know, there's a gigantic old historic uh, magnolia tree that, um, uh, I finally got my accuracy down to my uh, two and a half feet uh, below. It was it was much, but it was a little bit below it. Uh, but it took forever for the for me to register that. Um, but I do want to come back and where I have some of these accuracies that are are a lot uh, less um, to be able to come back and improve that accuracy. Uh, and in here you can kind of see I've clicked on this this one over here. So it's a, an armored gray, but if there's anything unusual about it, you know maybe it wasn't just the pin that was in the ground. So in case this one here, you can kind of see that the pin was found laying out of ground, uh, PDF map not showing any nearby HC high confidence um, marked. Uh, so I photographed it in place uh, from different angles when I recorded those photographs, um, we were, had kind of those in archive to have it, uh, gave some directions of where that pin because it's probably gonna be moved by the ground crews or just people coming and visiting, um, not knowing um, and, and picking it up and such like that. Uh, and also did put a, a flag marker left by it. But as we know, flag markers you know, deteriorate, they get moved and such. Um, but as much information as I could put in there about that, that area with it. Um, but coming back over here to the actual map graves. So you can see uh, as we go around in you know, those open areas, uh, there are a lot. Uh, an interesting thing when I was out there one day, a gentleman stopped and was asking me, you know, just was curious to say, you know, what are you doing out here? And at the time I was finishing up well, the first section, which was the largest section, and I had little flags all over the place. And so I explained to him that, you know, I was working on mapping out the unmarked graves here. Uh, and he had an interesting question. He said, now, how confident, and that's a lot of flags all over here, how confident you know that these are really unmarked graves. And so I explained them the process with the cadaver dogs we had and, and how they alerted and also the, the ground penetrating radar. I said, but also, you know, what also gives me kind of a, uh, a reason to believe that these really are, um, the way we're standing, it just looked like this, the flags were scattered just randomly. But then I said, you know, walk over this way just a little bit more. And as we walked over, you know, the, the flags from a different viewpoint kind of lined up. So kind of like you can see right through here, on uh, this uh, right-hand side, you've got, you know, a series of three, a series of three, you know, a series of three over here. Um, when the flags out there, they really started lining up and showing that these were probably family plots where the graves were next to each other. Um, we saw this, that, you know, that really was kind of brought home to them that there, there was, that was not just done by nature. These, these cavities un underground were not just, 
know, tree, tree roots that had rotted away, but there actually was some pattern to it and it was not a, a natural pattern to it uh, with that. And there's just a screenshot. I, I threw this in here because of what you never know if technology on live stuff is going to work. So I threw this in so we could show you uh, the secondary one as far as with the, the accuracy map, the, the second tab in that dashboard. So what are the next steps with this? Um, first, I'm going to be adding offset laser mapping uh, to my field equipment. And again, thanks to the, uh, the generous uh, benefactor that uh, was able to provide the GPS equipment um, for me to use and Flipper. Um, has been able to uh, allow me to add some laser offset um, equipment uh, to it. So I'm going to be using a, a True Pulse uh, 200X uh, and then the MapStar True Angle. Uh, and these are both compatible with the, the EOS Arrow 100 workflow. Uh, and so kind of will we'll all come in smooth, uh, smoothly. And one reason I did is because, as you can see, the old city cemetery, which I, that's my next project to map, you know, since I finished that flipper. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot more tree coverage in the cemetery, and so there's not as as, as ample opportunity uh, to be able to get a clear sky or relatively clear sky for good GPS signals to come in. Uh, so I'm going to be relying on this laser offset to set the the GPS equipment you know in an area where I can get a very good um, uh, clear sky view, and then be able to just do the you know pointing the laser um, uh, to the target and then be able to map that way. So we're looking forward to to be able to do that to improve that actually. Uh, so that was the, the one thing, you know, to increase that because uh, that tree covers there. Um, also plan to go back into Flipper Cemetery uh, and then those ones that those graves that had, you know, poor accuracy, you know, that be able back there and to improve that by able to helpfully set up into a clear area and then be able to, to get the targets there. Um, Again, just as I said, with Flipper, we want to return to Flipper uh, so we can use the laser offset to improve the accuracy. You know, I was really impressed with this uh, Arrow 100 that, you know, on the average, you know, the accuracy was, you know, you know 100, 1, 1.5 feet, uh, and, you know, one foot or so. Uh, so we had really good accuracy. In fact, let me just go back real quick here. You can see that the uh, uh, the greatest mapping was the, the 2.43. That was the greatest, you know, distance I had. Uh, but the average was at right 1.02 feet of mapping uh, um, accuracy, and this was for us just a submeter. So I was really impressed with the the results of that. Uh, and even the smallest I got was actually down to uh, uh, 0.26 foot, uh, which was and there was uh, quite a few that were right at the the foot mark or below. Uh, so, but those ones that were you know 1.5 foot or higher, I want to go back and using the the laser offset, get a really good clear sky, strong GPS signal. And then be able to remap those so we can get them more accurate, so that future people that are going to use this data, um, you know, that come come later on, will even have uh, better data than what they have. And then finally, we have Magnolia. So as I said, you know, the Flipper Cemetery actually was Magnolia Cemetery. It's now old Magnolia Cemetery. There is a new Magnolia Cemetery, even though we just call it Magnolia. But there's a historic section of Magnolia Cemetery. Uh, you have to go down Vine Street and, and actually past a little uh, creek area, uh, and then you'll come upon it. Uh, and this is a, a, an aerial shot that, that I took with our um, DJI uh, of that grave. And this is an area that we we haven't done a lot of work with, but we'd like to because you can you, know, you can just tell when you go walk. It's not as as evident, but when you're out there and you take the, the little roadway that comes in, you'll see depressions in the ground um, that are you know kind of indicative of an unmarked grave that is starting to, you know, the, the sinking in and such like that. So you see these, these anomalies in the ground, uh, as well as when you see some areas, you know, even though there's mowing tracks that you see are some lines, but like here in the upper kind of center area here, you have some markers, uh, kind of some kind of uh, ground patterns uh, going on here with the grass and stuff like that, that might be an indi indication of unmarked graves. And then just looking at how we have the clustering of, you know, family graves here, and you've looked just a little bit off here, we have a, a, a grave here. And I also have something that's kind of here in the center, uh, very uh, grave dimension-like uh, in the ground. So uh, we're, we're pretty sure there's gonna be a, a lot of unmarked graves here uh, as well. And so we wanna get that recorded as well. So that's gonna be something in the future. Uh, we're hopeful that we can bring back the ground penetrating radar, bring back uh, Miss Susie and her, her awesome team. 
uh, to work in this area and start identifying uh, some of the unmarked graves. One of the nice things about this, of course, we haven't done the work here, so hopefully as they identify with high confidence unmarked graves, uh, we'll be able to uh, GPS them right then and there and not have to come back, you know, 10 years later and try to, you know, relocate all these markers that are underground uh, in it as well. And so, you know, if you have well, want more information about this project uh, or you want to share what you've been doing in your historic cemeteries to preserve them or record them, you know, please contact me. I'm always happy to talk and learn from others about my experiences and, of course, learn from your experiences as well. So my contact information is down there with the email address or, or phone call uh, with that. And that would conclude. So I'm going to take a look right now, and I have not been paying attention to the, uh, the questions, so we'll see if we have any questions down there. Um, so the question we have here is, uh, what do you plan to do with the data collection? Uh, and that is a you know, that was one of, a question I get often quite, well, you mapped them out, now what you're going to do with it? Uh, so for the most part, this project, we wanted to preserve the history, uh, knowing that we have the iron pins and as, you know, that one we clicked on there and it showed it was iron pin out of the ground. I didn't find many, but I did find a, a few uh, and they can come out for several reasons. One I found was kind of bent and I, I suspect that the, uh, the survey marker had worked its way up just enough that when the mowing crew came through, that it got picked up by the mower and, and tossed out. So there's that potential of losing that. So, you know, one of the key factors of, of this mapping uh, is that we can have a, a better record than the PDF maps that Omega gave us. And it, in time, I don't wanna, not knock Omega, they did an awesome job and their maps are great, um, but having that GPS data, that that coordinate, uh, that long coordinate there of the, you know, relatively, of course, again, not using survey equipment, but uh, submeters, you know, at the relative location of these um, iron survey markers um, will be really beneficial. Uh, and who knows how what it, how it might be used in the future um, uh, by other people that come by. So, you know, the main purpose of this is to record and preserve this information. Uh, also, you know, there's one thing is, is kind of use it to show uh, it, you know, this this data can be used as part for, uh, for some of our grant funding as far as for our pres preservation works within our cemeteries uh, to show that, you know, when you look in there and kind of like the, the picture you kind of see in the background of this last slide, you see a lot of open area. Uh, there you see a few on the, the left-hand side of some of the marked graves and the walls and such as some family plots, but there's a lot of open area and also to, to kind of remind people and then for grant purposes to show that there is, you know, this was a very active cemetery, Flipper and Old City both, were very active cemeteries um, and that you know, you know when we are going for grants for preservation uh, we do have a an issue with the flipper cemetery some erosion coming off on one side uh, of the boundary area and so we want to come up with a solution that we can stop that erosion so this will be uh, helpful data in that grant grant process um, and solution process to show that we do have a very rich history here um, that we may not know their names, as I said earlier, but we do know that they're there and we do not want to forget them. And let me see if there, and I'm sure I haven't anything else. Uh, let's say, so what, uh, so question is, um, uh, what GPS equipment and software did you use to collect the data? And also, do you know uh, if this presentation was recorded? Um, so on the first part, yes, the presentation, um, should be recorded. I think it was uh, they have it set up to where it automatically starts recording. So and it will um, be uh, posted to our uh, the Shrugs YouTube channel um, probably within the next couple of days or or maybe sometime after Thanksgiving. But it will be you know relatively shortly that the all the presentations are being recorded and be there. Uh, as to the the GPS equipment um, with it, uh, so I did use the um, the EOS EOS Arrow 100 uh, is the one we used. It's a sub meter. Uh, one, in fact, let me go ahead and scroll on back real quick. And get to that one there. And I can show you to that person talking, kind of see what it looked, looked like. Uh, but that is the, the equipment I used. So I used that, the Arrow 100 uh, GPS equipment. Uh, and again, main reason I, I, I picked it, it was the one that I found it met all my needs. Um, I found some other other great GPS equipment was out there, and I won't name any by name, uh, but the, 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 the big ones out there all had great equipment, um, but there maybe was one quality that they were lacking. And this one, it had the Bluetooth connectivity. It had the cap um, capability to work with um, iOS, Android, and Windows. 
uh, which was important because uh, for other people in our within our organization, not everybody is using an Apple product, so we had to have something that could be compatible across different platforms. Uh, and also that these were partners with Esri and that they actually designed their GPS equipment uh, specifically to work with Esri and I work with other stuff, but specifically they do have a close relationship with Esri and uh, get a lot of testing. So it, it was compatible with collector, field maps, quick capture, survey one, two, three and all. Uh, and so as far as the, um, uh, the, the equipment, you know, it's a, the, it was a GPS and an iPad. And of course I got the, I bought a tripod and of course a, a ranging pole to, to mount everything on. Uh, with it. And let me check and see if there's any more. I know we're right at our time right now. And it looks like that might be all of the questions. Nope. Oh, no. And <laughs> there's a bunch more. So, uh, all right. Uh, CAD wasn't used for this process, but it was considered. Oh, uh, somebody refined that. So, uh, football and Ram has played these kind of projects. Some good people are talking about how um, uh, FPAN, Florida Division of Historic Resources, uh, also, also interested in identifying unrecorded abandoned. So I'm glad to see that other people are, are working on that. Um, question here is a good one here. So have you contacted the um, local historic churches for interment records? Uh, we have, and actually, uh, especially in Flipper, um, Missionary Baptist Church, uh, First Missionary Baptist Church, um, has some of their pastors are interned there. Um, and so we have reached out to them. Unfortunately, their records will show their pastors in term, but not necessar necessarily their members that were interned. Um, I have to say my 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 hope now is that, you know, somebody's going to be cleaning out grandma's attic or grandpa's attic or closet or shed or something, you know, and they're going to come across this record book and, you know, say this might be interesting and then uh, contact us. Um, you know, I hope there's a book out there like that, or, you know, even if it's just a partial one. Uh, but I guess we have looked at the the churches that do have known burials in there, um, and for most of them, that they have the 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 records of those that are already marked, but not of the unmarked uh, ones in there. Let's see. Have you considered using georeference maps such as historic plantation plats to locate lost cemeteries and natural resources? So for the purpose of this project, we're focusing just on the city's historic cemeteries. Um, but that would definitely be good, um, good reference points. I know we do have a, a book, um, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Kay McDonald, our senior assistant city manager, recently retired. Um, this is really her project. She, she her, and her interest is spearheaded. And, you know, it's kind of like an, an, an affection. She had it and then she gave it to me. And I think I'm, I think we compete as to who's more uh, compassionate about this project. Uh, but uh, one of the books we have does list all of the known cemeteries, whether they're private cemeteries, plantation cemeteries, church cemeteries and such in Thomas County uh, that we do use a reference. Uh, so, the, you know, as far as georeferencing the, the maps and locating it, that'd be an, an excellent thing to expand the project to, to identify other areas. But for the purpose of this project and, and uh, is we're, we're focusing just on the, the city's historic cemetery, the ones that we manage and maintain. And so would you consider getting certified as a ground penetrating radar operator? I would consider it, but the budget probably wouldn't allow, they might allow the certification, but they wouldn't allow the purchase of the equipment right now. Um, so that would be something that uh, I, I, at the present time for the amount of use that we would use ground penetrating radar, um, it, the cheaper option probably is to contract with uh, uh, companies like Omega Mapping Services uh, that already have the professionals and the and the, the training and certification and the equipment uh, for right now. Uh, will there be archaeological testing for the unmarked points? Uh, as of right now, there's there are no plans to do any type of archaeological digging or you know uh, proofing and such like that. Uh, like I said, when I was you know locating the 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 markers, you know if I got I got hit with the, the locator um, and it was underground, it was somewhere there. I was, Try to be very careful to not disturb um, the ground as little or too disturbed ground as little as possible uh, uh, out of respect um, of that being what you know sacred ground burial ground and such uh, so as of right now there there are no um, plans in order to have any kind of archaeological testing uh, for our points and that's why we also make sure we keep on our maps and, and let people know that we we identify these with hc or high confidence we can't say for sure without doing that archaeological work uh, but that may be something that at, at future, you know, 
teams in, in it later on to come after me that will want to do that. So that is always a possibility, but not planned right now. And let's see. Uh, the, and I think that's about all the questions, some other comments and, and suggestions and such, and I do appreciate those and look at that. And we are five minutes over, so I guess I better end it before, um, uh, before I get kicked out. Uh, but I do wanna thank everybody for attending. And again, um, if you wanna contact with me for more information or you have suggestions or ideas or um, some of your own work, um, to please just reach out and get back to that last screen there. Uh, reach out to me and be happy to talk to you and contract. And again, if you